There's a story that fascinates me. It comes from the histories of Herodotus, and uh, it involves language. Uh, Herodotus uh, tells the story of um, Egyptian pharaoh, the 7th century BC, whose name was Semeticus. And Semeticus was really interested in language as a topic uh, and finding um, uh, what was ultimately the origin of language, human language. So he conducted an experiment. And I don't recommend this one in, if you're a psych major. Um, but the experiment he conducted was to take two infants and give them to a shepherd. And he told the shepherd to completely deprive them of any human language, so no interaction with uh, these infants. And as they grew up, uh, to record the first words that they said. And because Semeticus felt that human language was innate, uh, he felt that the first words that they would speak would be the original human language, the first human language given by the gods. So uh, the children grew, and uh, they reached a point where um, one of them wanted something to eat, so he said, Bekos, to the shepherd. And uh, that was uh, a Phrygian word for bread. So the shepherd gave uh, the infant or the child uh, a piece of bread and uh, reported that, uh, to the pharaoh, and uh, he determined that the original human language was Phrygian, which is a language spoken in, uh, in modern Turkey, uh, because that was the first word that came out of the mouth of these infants. Well, you know, today we would look at this kind of experiment as being uh, kind of cruel and maybe somewhat frivolous, but it does address a, a fundamental question which has preoccupied people down through history, and that is, what is the origin of human language? And we as Christians look at this uh, from a biblical perspective, from a Christian worldview, and uh, we see this in light of the concept of language as part of our identity, as imago dei, as uh, people made in the image of God. God spoke creation into being uh, by saying, let there be light. So we see God communicating at the moment of creation. And in the same way, modern linguists have pointed out that Humans are different from all other um, animals and things in creation because we can create with language. It's a pale image of what God does in communication, but it is a reflection on our status as imago dei. But I'd like to address the question here about um, how God communicates with us. And to guide my thoughts... I would like to turn to Psalm 19, which I find to be a fascinating psalm because the entire psalm talks about language and communication, the languages of God. As we just heard, Psalm 19 starts out with a passage. I'd like to reread it. It talks about God's creation in nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. Their sound, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. This is a psalm of David. And the nice thing about psalms of David is we know something about David's biography. It's well recorded in the scriptures. So I can imagine him as a shepherd, as a young man, sitting out in the field looking at the sky and uh, being inspired by God in uh, the way that he describes here. But what do we find um, from this source of communication by God? What do we learn from God, from nature or through nature? Um, David says we learn the glory of God, his existence, his majesty, his greatness, one fear I have is that in our contemporary American culture, or maybe even the Christian subculture, this message is reduced to something that we would see uh, on the desktop of our computer, where we might have a beautiful image of some mountains, or um, maybe in a kind of greeting card, or in a, a calendar we would put up with pretty pictures on it. And that's very much trivializing uh, the way God speaks through nature. 
I'd like to share a few personal thoughts about this in, in terms of my recent experiences over the past few years. <clears throat> I've been um, experiencing nature in a new way during the past three to four years because I've taken on uh, a position as uh, uh, an adult leader in a local scout troop, which has meant that I've had to get out and go camping uh, once a month. Uh, I've gone to summer camps, and I've had to do what are known as high adventure trips, which are more extended uh, treks in the summer. And I really enjoy doing this because there's a phenomenon right now that, I, that really worries me in American society. And this phenomenon is defined by uh, uh, the author Richard Louvre as nature deficit disorder. In his book, Last Child in the Woods, uh, Louvre writes, uh, that nature deficit disorder is a dramatically increased tendency for children to stay inside. With the advent of computers, video games, and television, the average American child spends 44 hours per week with electronic media. And as he writes, an increasing pace in the last three decades of a rapid disengagement between children and direct experiences with nature has profound implications for the health of future generations. Against nature deficit disorder, Louvre contrasts um, the effects of being in nature. Everything from attention span to stress reduction to creativity, cognitive development, and a sense of wonder and connection to the earth. So to push against nature deficit disorder, I've taken kids out on high adventure trips. And uh, you can see one in the background here, backpacking in the Rockies for 10 days. Uh, other trips included uh, canoeing in the wilderness of Quetico in Canada. It's a pr province that's uh, got a wilderness canoe base. And for days we were canoeing, camping on islands, uh, didn't see another soul uh, except for our crew. <coughs> and, and another high adventure trip in included eight days of hiking across Isle Royal, which is the largest island in Lake Superior. And that's a p pristine wilderness that is a moose wolf ecosystem that we saw firsthand and, and some of the most difficult hiking I've ever done. How did God speak to me and the other people in my crew through these kinds of experiences? Well, the communication was much more complex than a calendar picture. It was a combination of beauty and danger, joy and suffering, cruelty and camaraderie, as we had experiences like walking along a ridge in uh, the afternoon and running out of water and experiencing dehydration. Or the opposite extreme, which was hiking through 36 hours of a downpour and uh, experiencing hypothermia and uh, kids falling and dislocating their knees and things like that out in the middle of the wilderness. Um, nature was uh, not uh, quiet and peaceful and beautiful. It was a combination of things. And the message we received through those experiences was our own smallness in the universe, our correct place in relation to God and his creation, our sense of fragility and evanescence in life. And even more, uh, these experiences drew me together with the others on my cruise in a, into deep relationships as we uh, existed within this kind of a setting and, and saw our proper place in the universe. Uh, this kind of communication is priceless in my experience. And um, it makes me think of um, a song by Noel Paul Stuckey that I used to hear uh, years ago called Why Do We Hunger for Beauty? Just a few verses from that psalm. Dark are the branches reaching for light. High is the path of the hawk in its flight, turning and gliding, greeting the night. Why do we hunger for beauty? Why do we hunger for beauty? Ultimately, our hunger for beauty in nature reflects our deeper hunger for God. That brings me to my next point in the psalm. I used to be a high school English teacher, and some days after class, I would walk around and kind of clean up the room, and I'd see notes 
lying under chairs, and I'd uh, pick them up and open them up and read them. <laughs> and often they were these really, really sappy love notes written by a boyfriend to his girlfriend or a girlfriend to her boyfriend. And uh, I didn't know who wrote them. Uh, I didn't really want to know who wrote them. But they sometimes went like this. Oh, how I love you. I think about you all day long. Just listening to your voice is sweet. You brighten my life. You are so wonderful. I'm panting with an open mouth, longing for you. Sometimes I call you and I wait for an answer. I'm awake all night long thinking about you. I don't know, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I, I felt that way sometimes as a teenager. Uh, and uh, it's pretty sappy. It's pretty sentimental. But actually, the words I just read are a paraphrase of Scripture. What did I just paraphrase? I paraphrased some, some lines from Psalm 119. Let me read the original. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. I call with all my heart, answer me, Lord, and I will obey your decrees. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night, that I might meditate on your promises. Pretty amazing passage when you think about it. This is uh, the psalmist's infatuation with God's communication in his written word. And I would ask you, how, how often do we really feel this way about the scriptures? We see the same passion in Psalm 19 in the, in the middle section where David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Same kind of passion for the law of the Lord, for the scriptures that we see in Psalm 119. One thing that I'm drawn to in this passage uh, are the verbs. It's interesting that he notes not only his love for God's law, God's word, his communication through his scripture, but the, the effect of that on him. Uh, he uses verbs like refreshing, making wise, giving joy, enlightening. Can you see that in your own life? Is God's word having that kind of transformative effect in your life on a daily basis? I have to say that um, as I've tried to practice this off and on through my Christian life, uh, there are certain passages of scripture that have come back to me again and again. And the scriptures are the same, but I've changed. So they speak to me in new ways. Let me share one example of that. When I was a teenager, a new Christian, I, um, I learned a song, a simple scripture song based on Isaiah 41.10. It went like this. I'm not going to sing it. But, um, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not afraid, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, when I was 17 and living in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., living a pretty comfortable life, that didn't mean a whole lot to me. I liked the little song, I, I memorized it and sang it. But when I was 22, I was working as a short-term missionary in Egypt, and I was on the coast in camps run by the Coptic Evangelical Church, and it was, I was there during a period of great social unrest, kind of like uh, the situation now in Egypt and other countries in the Middle East. And uh, one night I was in a camp, and there were uh, some radicals camped down the beach from us who came over and stole the cross from the camp we didn't know what they were going to do. They cut off the water supply to the camp. I saw Egyptian Christians suffering. And this verse came back to me. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not afraid, for I am thy God. 
And then a few years later, I was working uh, as an English language teacher in China at a university. And um, I was um, there also during a time of uh, great social unrest. In the spring of 1989, you probably remember, uh, there was uh, a protest movement throughout China, including some of my students that led, uh, ultimately culminated in martial law and the Tiananmen Square Massacre. And in my city, which was about 800 miles away from Beijing, uh, there was a lot of, uh, up, you know, grief. There was a lot, and that erupted into violence in the form of rioting. Uh, there was a sense of uh, concern about the future and even some concern for our personal safety, although that wasn't really being directed to us. As I gathered with uh, my wonderful Chinese students and other Christians, this verse came back to me. Fear thou not, for I am with me, thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And that verse went a little deeper for me. And then finally, um, I think of a time in 1998 when I was... Uh, at uh, Rice Pool with my two young children. I think Richard remembers this one too because his wife was there. But uh, one of my, my, uh, my older son, who was five at the time, wandered into the deep end of the pool. And it was very crowded. And suddenly I saw him being lifted out onto the side of the pool. And he was lifeless. He had suffered a drowning accident. A uh, paramedic, who was about uh, 50 yards away, came running over. And I stood there helpless and watched that paramedic administer CPR to my son. And my son came back to life. As I was in the ambulance driving from Rice Pool to Central DuPage Hospital, sitting there with my son, this verse came back to me. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not afraid, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, I will behold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I'm so thankful for passages of scripture like that. They've nourished me and spoken to me at key moments in my life. And I, I encourage you to think of ways to allow God's word to permeate your life in the way that David describes in Psalm 19 and allow God to speak to you as well. Uh, a metaphor I have for this is um, something I've shared with some of my classes, but I'll share it again. <clears throat> I was in uh, Thailand years ago for the first time. I didn't really know much about that country. And I was visiting some missionaries up in northeast Thailand, which is up on a plateau north of Cambodia. And we took a bus ride from Bangkok up to uh, a city in the northeast. And I was looking out the window, just really curious about the scenery around me. And I saw these endless, lush, green rice fields, mile after mile of uh, just incredible lushness. And as we uh, began to drive up to the plateau, we moved up into the highlands, I looked out and, and the scenery changed. I saw, uh, instead of green, I saw brown fields. I saw fields that looked withered. So I turned to the missionary next to me, I said, um, why, why is this changing? What, what's the difference here between these fields and uh, the fields that were um, down near Bangkok? And he said, well, this is dry rice farming. Uh, up here, uh, we don't have good sources of irrigation, so uh, we wait for rain to fall, catch it in reservoirs, channel it into the fields, but there's been a drought lately, and so uh, a lot of the rice crop has withered up here, whereas it's, it's really nice and green down near the rivers. And that uh, reminded me of a uh, you know, famous passage also in the Psalms that um, speaks to this idea metaphorically of our love for God's word. In Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. I think that's a great metaphor for my spiritual life. As I look back, uh, there have been times in my life I've been like the dry rice farmers. I've kind of gone from 
brainstorm to rainstorm from event to event. I've depended on chapel. I've depended on church, on retreats, sort of waiting for the rain to fall. But I think what God wants and what he describes here in Psalm 1 is being planted by streams of water, meditating on the word day and night, and irrigating ourselves with spiritual disciplines that encourage deep application of God's word to our lives. I'd like to turn to a third type of language spoken of in Psalm 19. And this one directly affects our communication even today. As David ends the psalm, he says in the famous passage, May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As I read through the scriptures, I see a a thread running from Genesis to Revelation that is very interesting to me as an applied linguist. God is very concerned about the moral dimension of our communication. He's very concerned about how we speak to others and whether that communication brings blessing or, in some cases, is problematic. And as David does in this psalm, um, we need to ask ourselves uh, that we, if, you know, if we're uh, holding ourselves accountable for how we communicate to others. One framework uh, that comes from linguistics that really interests me is, is on the slide behind me, and you've got uh, the kind of the standard normal curve here, but this is a description of how we communicate or how people in general communicate with people uh, you know, that they encounter in everyday circumstances. And uh, to just to briefly describe this, the continuum starts here on the far left uh, with communication involving strangers. And these would include service encounters that we have with people as we go to the store, we check things out, uh, purchase food from a clerk, or um, you know, we, we talk to somebody who is in a social role involving uh, service, maybe in a restaurant. On the far right, we have the opposite of that. Uh, communication with intimates. And these are the people that are in our families, that we're married to, our roommates, people we see all the time that um, we're very, very familiar with. And then in the broad middle of the curve is most of our daily communication. When we're at work or at school, we're communicating with people who are acquaintances, friends, and co-workers, fellow students. And Wolfson, Nessa Wolfson, uh, the the sociolinguist, pointed out that communication on the extremes is actually very similar and very different from communication in the middle of the curve. Now, how is that? Well, when we're communicating with strangers and when we're communicating with intimates, we're much more direct. We have a tendency when we make a a request to uh, just say, um, uh, could you give that to me? Or... um, give that to me. <laughs> uh, you know, if we're talking to someone who's uh, a, a waitress in a restaurant, if we're talking to um, our spouse, we tend to be very, very direct. If we're talking to people in the middle ground, we're much more cautious and much more polite. We might say things like, uh, would you please mind uh, handing that to me? Or something that's highly hedged in communication. It involves some kind of politeness formula. This was very convicting for me. Uh, because I realized something about my communication as I became more aware of how I communicated with people during the day. I was trying to be very polite to people in the middle ground that I worked with uh, because I didn't want to alienate them. I didn't want to lose the relationship. And Nessa Wilson points out that it's the people on the extremes who are in stable relationships with us or have no relationship at all that we're not that concerned about because we don't have any potential to lose the relationship. So we're very, very direct with them. And uh, I don't know what your experience was was if um, if you're married, but my experience was I was in the middle ground with my wife when I was dating her and uh, very, very careful to be very polite and gracious in my speech. But after a few years of marriage, things tend to get very, very direct. And um, that can be very convicting uh, when you realize it. I think it's good to hold ourselves accountable in this area, um, as David does. And I would challenge you, as you go through the day today, to examine how you communicate with others across a continuum like this, with people who are lower status or people that you don't know very well, 
or people you know very, very well? Are, is God blessing them through your communication, uh, through your language? Uh, or is it something more like what Nessa Wolfson describes here? So there are three forms of communication in Psalm 19. God's speaking to us through the natural world and, and the challenge for us to put ourselves in a place where we can listen to that. God's speaking to us through his word and the challenge to irrigate our lives with the scriptures in a way that allows them to transform us and speak to us where we are in life. And then finally, that God is deeply concerned with the moral dimension of our communication. So as we approach the rest of our busy task today here in Wheaton Grad School, I would like to leave you with these thoughts, which end Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer.